everyone, it's Kayla here. I just wanted to uh, give a quick uh, content warning uh, due to the nature of the book. We'll be discussing some uh, difficult themes. This will include uh, parental abuse as well as sexual abuse and what could be potential rape. So if any of those topics make you uncomfortable, please feel free to skip this episode. Other than that, on with the show. Welcome to Darkly Lit, where we wander through the forest toward a circle of rocks to investigate who is the real monster that inhabits this island. I'm your host, Kayla King. I am joined by my other wonderful co-host, Sade. Have you guys seen my bat? I mean, sword. It's bat. My bat sword. <laughs> <laughs> and David. Marion tried not to think about her own ass and Val's face and the proximity of the two. <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> if anybody's listening to this and hasn't read the book, they're in for a wild ride. We just finished reading Saw Kill Girls by Clara Legrand. Uh, I I mean, should I give the summary first or give our opinion? Well, we always begin with the summary first. What am yeah, I talking about? Yeah, summary. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess the best way to begin the summary is describe our three main heroines because... It switches between these three teenagers' point of view. We start with Marion Althouse, uh, who has just moved to Sawkill Rock, uh, an, an island that's basically a character of its own right, but we'll get into that. And she moves there with her mother and her sister not long after the loss of their father. And Marion soon discovers that things are not quite right, and the island starts to affect her. Our second heroine is Zoe Harlow, who is the police chief's daughter, and she's having her own difficulties, one of them being that she has discovered she is asexual and has broken up with her best friend and someone she is absolutely in love with, Grayson, while also trying to uncover the mystery behind her best friend's disappearance, um, her best friend, Thora. And then Val Mortimer, who... It has probably the most tragic and morally gray story of all the three girls. Uh, so she comes from a line of women who are very powerful and wealthy. But the reason they got that way is because they've been killing young girls, or well, they've been bringing young girls to this creature, or this boogeyman that inhabits the island known as the Collector, so he can kill and eat them and become stronger and stronger. Eventually, Charlotte, Marion's sister, becomes the next victim, and this starts the, I, I guess, the, gets the ball rolling as this mystery starts to unfold, and there's a lot of back and forth between the three girls. I, there's one point they get into a fight with each other. One of the difficulties is Val falls in love with Marion, and Marion starts to fall for Val, but both... Zoe and Marion know that something's not right with Val, and Zoe has a large hunch that Val is behind all this, which it turns out to be right. And eventually this also leads to Zoe discovering that her father, uh, the chief of police, is a part of this group called the Hand of Light, or he assists the Hand of Light, if I recall? He's an, like a, a knight or an initiate. He's part of this old esoteric order of monster hunters sort of and the collector is a monster they've been trying to track down and take down for many years but have been unable to and there is a prophecy where three girls um that turn out to be marion zoe and val will be able to take them down and eventually it does lead to that but there's a lot that happens. It's hard to, like, 
it's kind of hard to pinpoint like one a bunch of different things because it's a lot of different things that happen if i may i think that might actually be a good way to summarize it because everybody who's listening has hopefully read the book and knows the sort of the way things turn out because this is the point where you'd be like will they learn to be able to use their powers their gifts as granted to them by the rock itself which is kind of a character uh to defeat the collector or will they just get screwed over because of teenage hormones and uh lots and lots of pretty well written teenage angst actually actually and also the problem with the fact that the uh, hand of light are a bunch of uh, sexist assholes um what did you guys think of this story? <laughs> good summary though <laughs> i didn't mean i'm sorry i feel like i i feel like i just mansplained the rest of this which is very no, fitting for the theme of this god <laughs> well it, it's the, the tricky part is that a lot happens in this book. It's true. And trying to encapsulate it all into a one summary, it's going to take a long time. And mm. I, I, and then trying to figure out when it happens because it's, we switch between three girls' different points of view. And one thing's going on at the same thing that another thing is going on. And we're seeing like, the background behind Val's perspective while she's interacting with the collector. And then while that's happening, we got Zoe uncovering um, like hidden rooms and such. And then we got Marion who is going through her own trippy situation and is starting to have hallucinations and starts to be able to sense things. I think she calls it like the, the bone. The bone cry. The bone cry, yes. Uh, she starts to have this sense called the bone cry that makes her know when the collector is near or something bad's about to happen, along with the fact that there are mobs that are also leading her to the answer to this mystery as well. So, th- I mean, there's a lot that happens. Yeah. Um, I want to say real quick that I appreciate everybody's patience. We were supposed to do this episode in August, but a lot happened in August. So we moved it to September in that time. We, you know, we, the book is not quite as fresh in our minds as it was before. Kayla's read it twice Mm -hmm. at this point. I'd read it the first time. Uh, say this is also your first read through, right? It was, I actually listened to the audio book and, uh, until pre-summary, uh, I had already forgotten the main character's name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, I think it, it did stick with me. That's the main thing. But the the tricky part was mostly just trying to pin things in order. And I appreciate. Uh, originally, I was down to do the summary, and I want to say thank you to Kayla for being willing to take the summary on for that because that's this is it. It is tricky. It is really tricky, mm-hmm. but in a good way. It makes for a really compelling read. Um, I mean, gen- in general, I quite liked this. I thought it was a really good read. I enjoyed it. It kept me hooked. I really liked the language. And there's more things I like to it um, that I will get into as we go. But um, I mean, just right from the get-go, I'll say that I enjoyed the book. I'm a fan of Legrand's writing. I think it's a lot of fun, even if it can get really heavy sometimes, um, as it should, because it needs to be heavy this is a book that covers a lot of really really heavy uh topics and uh does so in a way that is both relatable and pretty savage at the same time i agree um so i did read this book last year or uh last year or two years ago um and i read the physical copy first this time i decided to listen to the audiobook as well just to get a different fresh take on it and it's just as good as I remembered. There was a lot of te- details that I missed the first time that I was able to pick up on this time. I was like, oh, okay, that's, okay, that makes sense. Because as I mentioned before, there's a lot that happens in this book. And I think that maybe could lead to the fact that it is, it, it is rereadable. Like, I, I definitely think that if you read this book once, if there's a point like later down the line you want to read it again, it's definitely one of those books that you can read again because so much happens and then you're like, oh, wait, oh, oh, okay. And then you can pick up stuff that uh, you may have not noticed the first time. I wouldn't read it again. Not that I didn't like the book or that I had like an overall negative experience. Like I, I do, I did enjoy a lot of like the imagery. I enjoyed the shift in like character perspectives and like overall all the characters had like 
interesting motivations and they were they were good characters but I didn't find myself invested in the story in the characters I kept having to remind myself like oh yeah I need to go back and finish listening to that and I thought for a while that maybe it was just because I was listening to the audiobook because um I don't know if there's like different versions but the ones I was listening it was a, a female um narration and, and it's a very calm and kind of soothing read of the book, um, even in like the really intense scenes. It was kind of really calm, and I was like, "Is is that why I'm just like I usually use like I've been doing the audiobook a lot lately for this because I've been working on a lot of things, and so it's easier for me to t- multitask that way." And I kept finding myself being like, "Oh, I was not paying attention at all to what." I was listening listening to, and I usually don't have that problem. I don't know what it was. I really have no actual complaints, story-wise or anything, but, like, nothing gripped me. You're not wrong, because I, when I listened to the audiobook, I actually had to, at times, go back to the book and read parts, because you're right, she, the narrator does have a very calm Mm. reading voice, and... Like, a lot of the times it's like, okay, your voice is way too calm for this sort of scenario. (laughs) That this horrific thing and that's happening. And and you know what? Maybe this just wasn't the book for her. Uh, I see that she's read a lot of other books. And maybe she probably has done a lot of better reading for that. But I think, yeah, her voice was a little too calm for this sort of story. I mean, speaking as someone who only read the book, I... Couldn't put it down. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I wonder if I'd had, I would have had a different experience if I had read instead of listened. Yeah, because my inner voice was really channeling and feeling the intense feelings these characters go through. I think the first thing I want to say right away is, um, I give stuff, and I have given stuff flack in the past for making teenage angst feel really vapid and pointless. This does teenage angst better than almost any other book I've read, in my opinion, because like what's happening to the characters is real enough and what's hard and it's hard for them to deal with but on top of that there's also what it is like to be you know a teenager in some ways and i think that some of the raw emotions that the characters are feeling particularly when it comes to like their their sexuality in places too is like it just resonated with me for some reason especially like when characters are angry with each other it felt <clears throat> it felt good it felt raw to like read I think that's the best way to describe this book. It does feel raw in certain places. But I, uh, another thing too is there's parts where I I would kind of drift or I couldn't get into it. But uh, yeah, the raw emotion, that was some good stuff. I really love the parts with, uh, I'm not gonna lie, my favorite chapters were with Val because I think her character is so complex and she is dealing in with a messed up situation even though what she's doing is terrible and almost unforgivable but i can't help but feel sorry for her and yet i also hate her but i it's it's a very complex emotion and that's what it's supposed to be she's the definition of a like a gray area character oh yeah i flip-flopped on val a ton just because i'm like it seemed like sometimes she reveled in it sometimes she hated herself sometimes she uh, was just, you know, she was manipulative sometimes, so you could see her being, you know, raw and being manipulated herself. And I, I, what I appreciated is that in the end, she can't really even forgive herself. She There's not really anything she could have done, but she's still, she's still guilty to a degree. It's interesting, because it, there's this very... Uh, Val's fascinating, and yeah. the situation she's in is fascinating because of this whole familial line drawing back to this this monster, this embodiment of essentially toxic masculinity. And it's it's sad because, you know, you, you pity her, but you also can't help but, like, is there anything she could have done different or is it just the situation where, like, because she is being manipulated and effectively abused her whole life and this is the only way she is and they're saying there is no other way, N- like... Not just abused, but, like, in a like mental way physical too like her mom slaps her yeah just because she's scared or uh there are moments where the collector is basically almost kind of sexually manipulating her yeah which is awkward when this is this guy or this monster has been using her mother her grandmother all throughout the lines and then 
there's a point where you find, and this is horrifying, uh, Zoe finds a bedroom underneath the uh, Val's uh, house. Like, it's a hidden room. Uh, King's Head. King's Head. Yes, that's the name of the estate. And the only thing in this room is a bed, like this four-poster bed, but there are scratches on the wall, and my heart just dropped, like, oh my god. Like, they don't even say what exactly happens, but you just know from hearing that. Man, the gut punch of horror in this one is really good. <laughs> and, like, there's there's even a point where Val gets locked in the room, and she's screaming. Nothing happens to her, but, like, it, it, it her mom traps her in there just to scare her. That's a form a, of mental abuse, yeah. uh, physical abuse too. But clearly horrifying things happen in this room. And I, oh my goodness. I wouldn't say Val definitely, she wasn't my favorite character, but I can say that she's definitely the strongest character in terms of like how complex she is. Or like how David was saying, like she's, she's she kind of goes back and forth between like, she has this like pride for like who she is and what she's capable of, but at the same time she hates herself for it and like where she got all that. And just like the complexity with her mother, where their mother where I think like the with the mother, especially the abuse that she inflicts on Val is more so if like Val shows weakness, that's weakness of on her part. So she can't have Val show weakness because that makes her weak. It's kinda how I was reading that, but mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a lot of like the the darkest like parts of the book were centered around like just Val's experience of like just just generational trauma that she has inherited Mm -hmm. is uh, pretty messed up. We've talked a little bit about all the stuff with the collector specifically in her is Mm -hmm. really, really fucked up. And it's like and what's great about it is this is still, you know, kind of a this is a young adult novel. And I what I, you know. There's, we've talked about this before. Young adult novels often have this misconception that they they hold back a little. Mm-hmm. I think that they get a lot across in subtext and sometimes just straight up just in there without um, having to spell it out. And I think Legrand does a great job like not pulling punches with the horror and the implication, but using more implication than anything mm-hmm. else for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And I like that. I like what it like leaves and it makes it almost more more um, more icky. Like a lot of the stuff that comes across. Who would, did you think was the strong, or not strongest, or who is your favorite girl out of the three? Me? Yeah. Or, Zo- uh, or or both of you. Oh, Zoe. Yeah, probably Zoe. Marion was actually very <laughs> boring to me. Marion was the most boring to me, too. I I think that her parts were the times I would drift the most, because I was just like, I just, I feel like a Marion almost comes across as a little too Mary Sue-ish at times. When I mean Mary Sueish, I mean people have a like dislike towards her. She's not like loved by everyone or everything, but it almost feels like whenever she does something, it's almost like sometimes she can't do anything wrong. I think the one time that I was like, "Oh damn, she actually did something where she was not in the right." Was when she said shit to Zoe about like, "Well, at least I know how to." have sex normally and you can like wow i yeah that was that was the one time i was like oh my god like you actually did something that wasn't like what i say is correct i know what i what's going on the bone cry tells me yeah i mean the she does suffer a little bit as i am saying i'm not disagreeing with you about the mary sue thing there are some moments i mean i wouldn't say she's a direct mary sue i think she's not a she's not a direct a lot of bad things do happen to her especially like early on like uh when she first gets the island and basically falls off a horse and it gets um crazy powers imbued on her that she can barely control and her character grows which is good i don't think there's a bad character in the bunch but i i will agree with you i think she might be the hardest to read about i i'm with you like i said I, she's mary sue ish i don't think she's a direct mary sue no there's a moment though that kind of bugs me <laughs> it i i it's weird i'm going into this with the negatives but like it's the moment when she's recovering in the the bed and she's just been seen by dr wayland do we ever establish that was, was dr wayland a real person or was he the collector of the whole he was a real person. He was just the he was the real family doctor, but we only happened to see the actual Doctor Whalen, I think, once. Okay, because every other time it's the collector masquerading as Doctor Whalen. Yeah. Yes. Okay, 
Because, um, so anyway, there's the part where she just kind of starts, like, Val's there, and she just kind of starts just opening up to Val for no reason, even though she's barely met her, about, like, this deep bond she has with Charlotte about, like, the starfish thing and, like, all this. And I'm like, this this felt like it kind of came out of left field, like this, this weird gushing confession to Val, who's someone she doesn't even know at the time. Now, granted, later they, of course, they get together, they have a relationship, it's complicated, but, like, at the time... It, it, it felt weird. Did it feel weird to you? It, I thought what it was, was uh, she was feeling threatened that Val was going to take Charlotte from her. And so she, it was kind of like a plea of like, this is how important she is to me. Please don't take her. I thought that's what it was. It didn't really work, did it? <laughs> I, I'm i sorry, that's dark. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, I think because... Again, Sixth Sense Marion is like, I know she's doing something, so don't take her away from me. All and it, well, it just it it's it's a strange moment. That's all I'm saying. That early in the book, when she kind of like Val kind of snuggles up to Marion to like comfort her, it doesn't feel like there's any kind of attraction between them yet or anything. So it's just kind of like it feels weird to happen in that moment. I think later when that starts happening it's fine it's written fine i mean i highlighted that section at the beginning because not only did it crack me up but i'm like this is <laughs> such a weird teenage thought in that moment about the cro- proximity <laughs> uh but yeah that 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 part just felt weird yeah honestly zoe was my favorite like that's a long-winded way to get back around to zoe <laughs> out of the girls zoe was my favorite but probably my favorite character was actually grayson mm-hmm. grayson is adorable character he is a cinnamon roll that should never be harmed. And yet he gets shot. Yeah, poor baby. <laughs> I think I liked Grayson because uh, at some point when he was like just being very patient with Zoe and like really understanding of her, like it reminded me of probably my closest friend who knows me better than anyone, Kai. So maybe you guys will get to make, meet when, when you visit. But yeah, mm-hmm. so Grayson was kind of endeared to me because he really reminded me a lot of Kai. Oh, mm-hmm. that, that part's interesting too, the relationship between uh, Grayson and Zoe. And I, I just like how matter of fact Zoe is and her perspective is very matter of fact the whole time too. She's just trying to figure out what's going on. She's thinking about Thora. She's thinking about, I, I love that the first time that we see Val almost i think one of the first times we see val is through uh zoe's perspective and the first thing uh we get from zoe's perspective is bitch 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 and i'm like (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna like zoe and god i love how much zoe and val just hate the fuck out of each other and that was i don't know i like i don't obviously near the end i don't want them to hate each other but i kind of dig the I kind of dig the way anger is written in this. I kind of dig the way the frustration is there and Mm -hmm. it's raw and it's between these women. And it's like the, the part near the end when they finally like Zoe and Val are fighting with their powers and they're just beating the shit out of each other. You just feel like this is a culmination of like, we hate each other. I want you to die. And I was like, I never see this happen. It never feels that visceral to me for some reason. But the, the way it was, like, the way it's been, it was built up made it satisfying when it happened. And even more satisfying when they had to put it aside to get something done. But they still can't really forgive each other. Well, well, Val can't really forgive herself. But I like that Zoe is like, look, we can do this. But, like, I still can't really forgive you for everything that happened. And Val agrees. And it's like, I like that they have to put that aside. But it's just, I don't know. It just, there's something realistic to me about the way the anger and the culmination of it was handled here. Maybe this is me speaking from just what I, what hooked me, but I just, I liked it. I liked the, I liked the raw emotion, whether happy, sad or whatever with all of these characters. That part did uh, almost kind of got ruined for me because of the handle. Like I, I, I don't. The, so the weakest part of the book. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if I want to bring this up because we do have some questions and uh, a few of them have to do with the hand of light because I think a lot of the readers thought the same thing that you and I did and most likely say, say, what did you think of the hand of light? I was like kind of whatever on them and then there's there's a part where I think that the girls are fighting or they're about to fight and that one of them is spouting off shit and Mm -hmm. I don't even remember exactly what they said but I just like kind of stopped what I was doing and did like ugh 
now this is this just tastes <laughs> yeah. awful and like th- i really kind of i kind of maybe ruined the rest of the book for me because i was just like this is just cliche and gross yeah that's cliche and gross is right uh, um do you mind if i bring up the questions then if we're going to talk about them and uh, the ones relating to the hand of light at least sure. yeah so uh, we actually got one question from Urkelbot666. Thank you, Urkelbot666, or Dan. Hi, Dan. How do you feel about the Hand of Light and their inclusion late in the story? And he gave his perspective. I had a hard time with the Hand of Light. I thought their cartoonish woman hate almost undermined what was a wealth of interesting and progressive gender slash sex roles throughout the book. I understand the necessity of their inclusion, but the execution of Briggs especially took me out of a little of the story. It felt a little like a superhero movie sequel where they throw in more villains to pad it out. <laughs> and then uh, Bringer of Lighters, uh, thank you, Bringer, uh, asked quite a few questions. And one of them also uh, includes the Hand of Light, which is, why hasn't the Hand of Light tried anything else to get rid of the monster? <laughs> yeah, I'm with Dan... Yeah. Also, Dan, thank you for including your perspective. We love when you guys share your own thoughts and let us share that here on the podcast. Uh, as you were reading that, I was like nodding my head. Same. Um, mm-hmm. And it was very well put. Uh, it really, really just undermines everything else that we've established with some really great female characters. And yeah, it was just such a sour note. Like, you're eating this cake, and it's a pretty good cake, and you're having a good time, and then you, like, bite into, like, a rock of salt or something. It was kind of the experience. Yeah. I felt they were a bit unnecessary. Mm -hmm. I felt like they almost were put in there just to hammer in the fact, get it? Because gender roles, and the patriarchy, and I was just like... No, I, no, I get it. The collector was enough. Like the, I, the collector, like I said, the collector is a embodiment of the worst aspects of toxic masculinity. It's like clear as day, but it's also written in such a way that it's insidious and subtle and horrible. Mm-hmm. And like the collector is a- almost all we needed. We didn't. When you got these people cartoonishly spouting out things about how these beasts need to be controlled and. You know, it, and and like they're basically like sniffing the girl's hair and like that trying to gross. grope them that as is. they're like fighting. It's just like, like I, 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 I get it. Men are shitty, but like, <laughs> I I get part of why they exist. It's like there's the other part that it gives the idea like, oh, we've been trying to look into this and trying to research this. And this is how we get a lot of, like, information about the three girls and what this collector does, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have Chief Harlow, and it's already revealed that he has already been looking into this. Why couldn't it just be him? Why couldn't he be like, no, I've noticed this myself. I know there's something wrong with this island. Here's what my research has found. Or And he's been doing it for years. Or, what? you know... The hand of yeah, I'm with you. Like that could that could work. It would require a bit of a tweak of the ending, but like I could see it just being Chief Harlow as an independent. Maybe he found an older organization that has since disappeared or something. But or you could still include the hand of light, but somehow tone down on the Machiavellian like mm-hmm. cartoonish boys club kind of vibe of them. Like you could you could prop. There's probably a way that could be done that makes them more. I don't know. It just, it really veered into like almost mustache twirling in its execution. And what is otherwise a really brilliantly executed book in terms of like the commentary on, you know, female empowerment and relationships and the struggle with toxic masculinity and patriarchy and like this vicious cycle that, that in that engenders in society. Mm-hmm. And, it it almost you know. feels a little bit like an insult of like, Oh, I don't feel like the readers are clever enough to figure all the like figure the subtleties out. Let me just slap them in the face with what I was trying to say. Maybe that sounds meaner than than what it was, but it, I, it could be taken that way. I say. I I think it could, and it, but like you know, I don't. I maybe I don't know if Legrand was trying to get across potentially the idea of a different kind of toxic masculinity you know the kind that's like a holier than thou attitude but like when you look at like reality there are like 
with both those things and toxic like that type of masculinity does exist where it's like the the very like manipulative you don't realize it until you're like in its grasp type of like I'm just evil <laughs> people men who are like that and then there's like in your face kind of just like obvious like you know frat boy type of ugh, masculinity that what is what the hand of light or I forget what they're called felt like yeah I don't the hand know. of light I mean they're both there it, it just feels unnecessary it did feel unnecessary in this book in this story and no because you are right I mean I've seen it firsthand I've I've witnessed frat boy mentality and uh like guys thinking it's like well why can't you like me i'm a nice guy you just think you're so too highly of yourself like i've been told that directly by someone that it absolutely exists but for this story purpose we don't need it It, it's it's too heavy-handed it just feels like it's such an odd bit when again i want to highlight how good the collector is as a monster and a representation of everything that's wrong with like you know masculinity yeah to i did very much enjoy the collector as just like a character and as a monster um uh, he's like 100 percent the type of character that i'll play in a game um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i loved the collector what do you think of his description because he does get a description at the end of a book, like when you see his actual form, because throughout the book he shapeshifts yeah. into different humans. One of his favorite forms is a young boy, in order to mess with Val's head. But at the end, we actually see his form, and oh, it's a good description. But the only part I remember of that description was uh, something about a rat tail like tail. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that kind of overtook the rest of my the image in my head so i just kind of pictured this giant mutant rat thing which was terrifying (laughs) um i don't know do you want to read the description (laughs) yeah let me hold on let me get the book back (laughs) feel free to cut this out kayla but in a more heavy-handed book it would have shown up it would have just been a big penis (laughs) (laughs) just a mad giant penis very phallically shaped monster (laughs) Yeah, like a big, horrible worm with, like, a cleft head. Oh, God. (laughs) So, here's what it says. Crawling out of the tree, dragging himself up from inside the ruined trunk, was a pale, flesh-colored beast with long limbs and cratered skin. Lidless black eyes, like holes drilled into soft clay, gazed unblinking from beneath a severe, jutting brow framed by bat-like ears. Long flaps of skin trailed between his shoulders and elbows and long two-clawed hands shaped like hook scythes. From the skin flaps hung clusters of bloodied feathers. Between his joints, stretchy rope strings of flesh that bunched together and pulled apart with every movement. Slippery knots of skin floated up and down his arms like melting wax, merging with the elastic joint skin to knit new hands that punched out of his arms, thick and bludgeon-like with long bent fingers. His black legs ended in long clawed feet, with toes thick as tree branches. Glistening with slime, they curved under the narrow soles of his feet and seemed to bear all his weight. (laughs) That's a good monster. And then uh, later on it says here, uh, His lipless jaw so wide it hinged just below his ears, dropped open with an ear-splitting roar. Inside his gaping mouth, Ribbed a dozen smaller ones, bursting out like tentacles and lined with tiny chomping teeth. The mouth with a dozen other mouths inside. Well, he is hungry. <laughs> that is a horrifying description. When your mouth opens wide and there's another mouth inside, it's a more, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sorry if I didn't do that, Nara would have killed no, it's me. perfect. <laughs> uh, a thousand points to save. <laughs> Um, yeah, that sounds terrifying. I wish I had paid a little more attention to that scene, because that would have uh, played out way cooler in my head. That part I reread in the book, like, because again, there were points where I went back and forth between the audiobook and then reading the actual book. Most of it I tried to do the audiobook just because 
time mm-hmm. life. But I think I got more out of it when I'm reading from the actual book book than listening to the audiobook. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading that in the book and I'm like, damn. Yeah, I I really feel like I, I would have had a better time if I just read the book. If I'd been able to just like sit down and find the time to read it. But I can't always. So you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. Mm, that's true. I feel like there's some books that should be read, like physically, and then there's some books that should be listened to, or you can easily listen to. I think um, I recently read a book called uh, The City We Became. I absolutely recommend the audiobook. It is so fantastically told by audio. But this book, I, maybe it's, I think it just might be better as read rather than listened. What do we think? Well, I'm thinking of points here that would be raised. Uh, what do we think of the little asides that make the rock itself a character? I thought it was interesting. I don't know. I think it fit well with, like, because it helped explain, like, where the girls were getting their power and, like, insight into just kind of, like, the the uh, collector. And, like, I enjoyed it. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I I really like the fact that it exists and I like that I'm really I dig stories where when there's kind of a modern magic element to it I like that the rock is this like primordial almost unknowable sense of just unfathomable ancientness and it just it's a it's the protagonist it's a protagonist it wants to help the the girls overcome this thing that shouldn't be there and I love um I really enjoyed the moments when you could like hear when you kind of got insight into the rock's thoughts that as a thing that is kind of hard to pin down as an entity, you know? I don't know. I just, I liked it. I thought it was a good touch. Yeah, same. I think it actually, it could have easily made the story weaker because you could have been like, well, really? Why is this here? But no, it actually does enhance the story because like say said, um, you can see where it got its powers. You can see that it's trying to assist the girls in trying to defeat this evil. It's definitely its own character, I, like, already the Saw Kill Rock felt like its own living, breathing thing when you arrive on the island, or when Marion arrives on the island. Mm-hmm. I think it added also this really nice balance of, like, of, like, you, you, you have the collector and you can only, we only really see the collector from, like, Val's perspective or just from everyone who's, like, like learning about it. Or talking about it and it's this like evil kind of mysterious force that we we know of and we're, we're witnessing whereas with the rock when we were hearing it reading its thoughts uh it was a little bit more of like this almost intimate kind of exposure to to oh there's a there's a good force in this in this world or on this island it literally is the island but um but yeah it was like this nice balance between like this evil dark force that is the collector and then this like trying to help guiding force that was the rock uh there is a question by bringer um that has to do with saw kill rock which is what is the rock exactly is it exclusive to saw kill or is it always there to grant the chosen girls powers i like to think of the rock as zordon (laughs) (laughs) like there's probably other entities like it around the world but Mm -hmm. the rock this is the this is the zordon for the saw kill girls gives them their mighty morphin powers the rock itself is the command center. <laughs> who's uh, who's Alpha then? What was Alpha? Uh, Alpha was Grayson. <laughs> <laughs> um, she can read Latin. Oh man. Yeah. No. I think uh, it's kind of like uh, the idea of like of of uh, nature having spirits. You know, like uh, the, it was like this is the spirit of the island. Is how I took it. Same. That's what I thought too. Yeah. And I figured there other places have that same sort of spirit or its own spirit. In this case, Saw Kill. It's the Saw Kill Rock is basically the natural spirit of the island itself. It's represented in the trees and in the the the, the waves and in the the rock itself, but also in and the, the moths. moths. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say mm-hmm. the moths are a great example of how the it's moths, able to communicate. Even the horses. Yeah, which is interesting because the horses weren't always there. They were, you know, they would have been brought over. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if the horses, generation of these horses are then being born on this island, they are now part of the island. That's true. They are subsisting off the grass, which grows Mm -hmm. from the rock, which is part of the rock itself. I do love the fact, I actually did enjoy the fact that the Hand of Light was ultimately defeated by a bunch of horses. (laughs) 
uh, when we got this book, we actually heard Claire Legrand talk about it. It was actually... Um, you you know, did. I actually did not meet her. You and... Oh, yeah, book. yeah. I was at the signing. The One of the things she mentioned was she the way that she wrote the island, and if I recall the quote correctly, is she said, I kind of wanted to write the island that, you know, a lot of young young girls, like, imagine is pristine. And, you know, the girl in me that loved horses wanted there to be this perfect island with horses. And so, but of course, the horses are more of a representative of representation of what's kind of wrong with this place. Like, un underneath it, there's something else. But the fact that the horses, these things that are such a epitome for young young girls sometimes, I mean, there's that there's that stereotype, like, oh, all, all girls go through a horse phase. Um, the fact that the horses are on the so their side and defeat the Hand of Light, I think, is a pretty telling statement. And just in that, drawing from that element. And I thought it was pretty smart. <laughs> Actually, speaking of which, I just I just thought of something else, too, that I think is a, a nice little touch. Um, you know, we've only, like, Marion is, is new to the island, right? Like, her family just moves there at yes. the beginning. So Zoe and Val are the only two characters that are native to Sawkill, or at least are established in Sawkill at the start of the book of our, of our three mains. Well, Val is actually born there. Um, Zoe came to stay there. Right, but both of them have more Sawkill cred than, than Marion. I mention this because thematically, you know, in the Sawkill girls, you've got two diametrically opposing forces already. You've got Zoe, who is trying to stop these things from happening, find out what's going on, is, you know, being kind of a detective, being kind of a, you know, going around getting her own shit done, with a little help from Grayson, of course. And then you got Val, who is, you know, caught up in this thing on the other end. You know, Zoe means life. Like, that's the root of the name is life. And Val's last name is Mortimer. Mort means death. Jeez, David, I didn't even <laughs> yeah. figure that. And so you've got life and death in this, like, opposing struggle with each other. And they're both kind of representing different aspects of that. So when they fight, it's also kind of symbolic there, too. But also when they unite, it makes it even better. Anyway, just something I thought about. I didn't even think about that. I like that did not click in my brain. The fact that you figured that out is quite nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Should uh, do we have any other things to discuss, or do you want me to go on to the rest of the questions? I'm ready for the questions. All right. Do you like the lesbians? Do you like the lesbian parts? I mean, yes. <sighs> I'm Fujoshi trash. I like when the boys are with the boys. Like, I'll, I'll enjoy some lesbian action, but I'm Fujoshi trash. No, nah, that's fair. Maybe if I was, like, invested in the characters more, I would giggle over it a little more, but... See, I, I'm lesbian trash. I love lesbian romance stories. Um, I also like gay romance stories, but I also love my lesbian romance stories. And it's actually, it's nice because there's a joke where... With gay romances, it's like they sleep with each other right away. We're lesbians. It only builds up, and then they just end up holding hands. And I'm like, oh, good. Finally, a lesbian sex scene. There is only one other book that I have read that actually has legit lesbian sex scenes that are lesbian stories. And that one is called uh, One Last Stop, which just came out this year. So, so if you want to read some good quality lesbian sex scenes, I, re I highly recommend that book. If you want some good quality gay sex scenes, same writer wrote uh, Red, White, and Royal Blue. I've heard of that. That's some quality gay boy sex scenes. Uh, anyway. I but, just... th but this one is like, finally, two girls sleep together in a book. I rarely ever get to read that. I was pretty happy with it. Me too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think, I felt like I said, I felt like at a certain point, the stuff between uh, Val and Marion started to make sense. Like, just the, the raw kind of attraction they have to each other, if not just like, and that's, again, fueled by the kind of teenage hormone nonsense that exists. Yeah, at first it felt very, like, I mean, they, it felt just kind of like, oh, you barely, like, the, like I didn't see any reason for their connection at first. And then I was like, well, okay, well, but they're both touch-starved teenagers. Okay. It makes more yeah. sense now. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think it made more sense after Charlotte disappeared. Cause... Which makes it even more fucked up. But... <laughs> yeah. I do. I will say I did very much appreciate the fucked upness of like their relationship. Because yeah. I, lo I always love me some problematic content. So Again, this thing does teenage angst so goddamn well. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned, David mentioned the, like all the, the raw emotions of just like the teenagers is handled really well where it's like yeah teenage drama tends to be over dramatic but it it feels it felt genuine and, and like david said it just felt raw 
I think it was really well written in this. Yeah. I mean, you could tell like a lot of what happened with Val and Marion that first night when they do sleep together is very much fueled by the fact that they're both going through some shit. Mm hmm. And they just mm-hmm. really need to take that comfort in each other. And what I like is, you know, even at the end, and we could talk about that maybe a little later too, but like, because I think we do want to get to questions. I just wanted to, to read the room about that. And I just thought it was, I think it earned it. I think the book earned it. I, that scene came up and I was satisfied. And uh, I, I think the relationship worked based on the circumstances of what are going on between uh, Marion and Val. And especially made it satisfying when Marion did find out what happened to Charlotte and was basically like, goes to Val and is like, I hope you fucking die. <laughs> and I'm like, this is, oh God. <laughs> and then of course at the end, it's like, I still love you though. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, these people. This author is so mean to her characters and I love it. So one of the questions that gets asked, you mentioned lesbian representation. Bringer asks, do you think the book represented an asexual character well? This is the first time I've gotten to read a book that had, like, ace rep in it. Actually, I might have to take that back. I have to, maybe I need to mm-hmm. read this other book. It might have had ace character there. But I myself am not ace, so I don't know, I don't feel like I could say, like, how well it represents, it represented, um, like, just the struggle of being ace and having people understand that. Um, but I feel like it did really well. Like I felt really empathetic to to Zoe. Like I was, it, I, I, and then especially like Grayson, being a good example of like how to be understanding and patient of someone if you're in a relationship or care about someone like that and you want to be with them, uh, and just like understanding like that that this is who they are as a person and there's nothing wrong with them. I feel like it was a good representation. I don't think I'm qualified to say if it is or not, but I really appreciate the effort that it made. Yeah, I agree with you. I think from an outsider perspective, not being ace myself either, it's it it felt like good representation. So I Mm -hmm. I agree with you there. Yeah, I mean, I'm not ace either, so I can't. I think everyone here really loves sex. (laughs) Yeah, we do. (laughs) And so we're like, yay, lesbians. (laughs) (laughs) That's why we got all excited about lesbian (laughs) sex. On that note, the scenes where where Zoe's asexuality is being addressed, whether it was like Marion realizing how fucked up what she said was, or it was Grayson being like, it's okay, or her, or Zoe just being like, is there something wrong with me? Like, the, all those scenes were way more interesting to me than the lesbian sex scene. So I, I think it was well written. Mm hmm. No, I agree. It's one of the, again, it's one of the things I think adds to the struggles that Zoe is going through, too, in the story. Like, just having to come to terms with that and the way other people are having to come to terms with that. Now, you know, not to mention the fact that she's, like, you know, she's questioning, like, you know, like, when Marion says a thing, do you, do you realize that, like, how many nasty things people have said about they? Like, they say Grayson broke up with me because I was black or something like, and or, or maybe this other thing, like, she's not good at it, or, and I was like, God, wow. Yeah. <sighs> Zoe rocks, though. She rocks so hard. She's the best. Uh, I've, I've met, um, had friends who are asexual, and I feel like this is, from what I've read, this is similar to their experiences. Like, they thought to themselves, there must be something wrong with me. Yeah. Actually, one book I, I'm going to, I want to recommend this book because I feel like there should be more ace books out there. I might, it's not scary enough, but there are a couple of horror elements, and I might suggest this for Darkly Right Read, but um, this book is called Elat Soe, uh, which is written by Darcy Little Badger. It's more fantasy than horror, but it's about a Native American asexual, aromantic young woman, and she's solving this kind of mystery, but she also has the ability to bring ghosts, like, uh, like conjure ghosts. Ooh, that sounds cool. Yeah, right? and It is written by someone who is asexual um, and is also Native American. And I'm, again, it's not exactly horrific. There's nothing scary in the book, but it has a couple horror elements. I might recommend it for Darkly Lit, but for now, I will completely recommend it as a read. It is a, it was a great read. I enjoyed reading the book. Fantastic. Just throwing that out there. 
other than that, I don't want to, there's not really much more I bring up except Claire Lagoon clearly likes a wrinkle in time, hence the tessering thing. Interesting ending involving dimension hopping, and yeah. Mm-hmm. Another question is, do you think the book is trying to make a broader statement about being stuck in the ways of old traditions? Kind of. So a little bit with the Hand of Light, it just like their their traditions or their whatever. Uh, but also a little bit with like uh, being trapped in like family traditions with like Val and like her family being stuck uh, in servitude with the collector oh. of like you have these like passed down family traditions that like restrict who you are and just like you know like that kind of also tradition there there's there's some elements of it i mean i don't think it was like the focus focus but it it there was it was there another question is is the monster actually dead why didn't no one think to try and kill the monster in its home dimension because i don't think anybody was able to get to the home dimension this is the, i mean marion's was the first person I, that i can think of mm-hmm. that has the ability to Teleport. Te- teleport or tesser as it's referred to as so i don't think anyone maybe someone did think of it but i don't think anyone thought hey let's see if we can get to its own dimension if they can't get there themselves this had some like watcher in the woods vibes i haven't that's seen a deep rep that reference. is a deep cut i haven't seen yeah. that film but that's a deep cut yeah yeah um as for the monster being dead i think it's worse than death whatever it's dealing with right now <laughs> which is what it deserves of course yeah I don't know. It's probably dead. Or or worse than death is always nice, too. I'll go with that. And then the last question. Do you think Val is innocent of what she's done? Where does the monster control begin and end in her actions? Yeah, that's the tricky part. I think the tough part is, one, is her age. Mm -hmm. She's still a minor. Also, I mean, I think I consider her guilty, but at no fault of her own, because she was literally born into this and was raised to to do what she does. Mm -hmm. So, like, even, like, how she holds herself, like, oh, I could have ended it if I had been a better, stronger person, like... She's guilty, but I at, at no fault of her own. That is that is my. Thing. That's the important thing about recognizing situations where there's uh, manipulation and abuse. Yeah. Especially when you're you're born into a life that you can't control. Mm-hmm. There's a certain amount of guilt you can put on her. A certain amount of guilt she can put on herself. I cannot hold it against her entirely, just because. What's the alternative? The alternative is uh, she is effectively tortured by this monster. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I mentioned before, if she ever shows any sign of fear, she's immediately abused. I mean, she's slapped. If she shows any sign of weakness or that she can't do this, she's punished. Like, there's really no way out. And as Sayin mentioned, she's born into this. She's a victim who makes more victims. Yeah. But the problem is, it's not a oh, am I doing the right thing or not? I think she knows she's doing the wrong thing. It, 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 yeah, again, she is guilty because she is still, what she's still doing is bad and she knows what she's doing is bad. This isn't an insanity thing. No. But it's, like Say said, no fault of her own. Mm-hmm. That's all the questions we have. Do we have any final thoughts? I really like this book. Despite some of the, the things I'll poke at it about, I still really like this book. I will definitely read it again at some point. I, while it wasn't uh, my favorite read of the year, and I, I did have a hard time keeping to it, there's no reason I wouldn't recommend this to someone if I, if I felt that they would enjoy it. I think all around it is a good book. There's a lot going for it. Um, I would definitely recommend it. It is a heavy book, so I would give content warning to anyone who wants to read it. But it isn't my favorite either. I still think that goes to the only good Indians. <laughs> that book was really good. But yeah, it's still, it does Teen Yanks very well. And the themes are well told with the exception of the Hand of Light. And I think it does include a very horrifying, wonderfully terrible monster, which that's always nice to see. And great lesbian representation, so. Yeah, good cast of lead characters. And I think some excellent world building too. Mm-hmm. Great setting, too. Yeah, considering the setting is itself a character. Like, literally a character. <laughs> uh, next we- month is October! Yes! It's, it's Halloween month, everybody! <laughs> Woo! Of the year. Ding <laughs> dong. dong. Ding dong. That's the sound of the Requiem bell. <laughs> we were trying to figure out uh, what kind of book to read for Halloween, and we like to keep in the theme of the, like that Halloween feel. And luckily, a book just came out in July that is absolutely Halloween themed. It is meant for 10 to 12 year olds, but it's written by Joseph Fink, 
who one of the creators of Welcome to Night Vale. This book is called The Halloween Moon, which this sounds adorable. Or it sounds adorable, but it's like it, it feels like it's so drenched in Halloween that I, I'm looking forward to it. It's it's nice to read like something kind of new too. Also, the the audiobook is written by Kevin R. Free, which is awesome. We got to listen to him read uh, uh, the Ballad of Black Tom, and that was so good. It was really good. If you want to join with us, uh, please buy, uh, buy this book at uh, buy this book at your independent bookstore, or uh, if you want to order it online, I would recommend going through Bookshop.org. Um, any money that goes to independent stores, and you can actually buy from independent stores through that website. Also, go to your local library. I just looked and it is on Libby, so yeah. If Having you... fun isn't <laughs> hard if you've got a library <laughs> card. If you like what you hear here, please check out other podcasts on the Creative Horror Network at creativehorror.com. Also, uh, with Halloween coming up, uh, there's going to be more uh, treats and tricks. Basically, that website are gonna, is going to light up a bit more, let's just say. We're going to light some jack-o'-lanterns and put them all over the place. You won't be able to see them because they're going to be real jack-o'-lanterns and this is like a, a website, but you know. It'll be there in spirit. Also, uh, we're adding the backlog of Darkly Lit on the YouTube channel, um, so you can listen to old episodes on U our YouTube at Creative Horror. I think that's uh, that's basically all the plugs that I have. <laughs> now that we, the monster is, well, hopefully living a fate worse than death, shall we get off this island? Well, we gotta go find all those other monsters that are ruining people's lives and deal with them too, right? Let's, let's start a wizardry school. <laughs> <laughs>《ディーズニング・イン・トレピッド・リスナーズ》This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinara, and this podcast is part of CreativeHorror.com, a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at CreativeHorror.com. <laughs>